my name is Mariel Caballero and I am the chair of the Planning Commission. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of June 9th, 2021. This meeting is being held via Zoom conference call due to the COVID-19 crisis. Members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. You may also view and listen to the meeting on live stream cable TV, Granicus, and YouTube. If you would like to provide public comment, you have two methods to identify yourself to provide public comment. All members of the public will remain on mute until the individual identifies they would like to speak and you are unmuted. Following roll call during summary of hearing procedure, we will review how the public may provide comment during today's So at this time, I will do the roll call. Vice Chair Bonilla. Here. Commissioner Casey. Here. Commissioner Garcia. Here. Commissioner Lardinois. Commissioner Oliverio. Commissioner Torrens. Present. And Chair Caballero is here. At this time, I will read the summary of hearing procedures. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. If city staff will call out the names of the public who have identified themselves um, and the items they want to speak on. You may identify yourself by using the raised hand feature on Zoom, clicking star nine on your phone, or you may call 408 535-3505 or email planning support staff at San Jose CA.gov and identify your name, phone number, and what items you would like to speak on. <clears throat> As your name is called, city staff will unmute you to speak. After we confirm that your audio is working, your allotted time in. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. After the public testimony, the applicant and a may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Staff will unmute the speaker to respond to the commissioner. The public hearing will then be closed and the Planning Commission will take action on the item. The Planning Commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions, and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence to the city at or prior to the public hearing. The Planning Commission's actions on rezonings, pre-zonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protests to the City Council on rezonings and pre-zonings. The Planning Commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with Section 20.100.220 of the Municipal Code. So at this time I call this meeting to order and I'd like to move on to public comment. Um, if anyone would like to make um, public comment for two minutes on items that are not on the Planning Commission agenda today, please raise your hand at this time. Again, this is for items that are not on the Planning Commission agenda today. Okay, um, B. Beekman, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Hi. Uh Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for your meeting tonight. Um, I wanted to try to offer that um, I haven't mentioned it for a while, but it's really important to myself that uh, the notification process for 4 and 5G 
uh, when it's uh, being placed in new uh, neighborhoods, um, it needs to have a good, uh, clear notification process for the public. And if you do that, it's an incredibly important step in uh, you know, what can be how to bridge our digital divide issue. And that the digital divide issues are not just placing and slamming in a whole bunch of new four and 5G in this time of COVID uh, and then say, voila, we, we're now a, a digital savvy community. It's learning to have open public policies in placing all of that new and four and 5G. That's the sustainability. And that's the issue that I'm really concerned about and wanna work on and figure out ways to work on that. I figure it's a, a clear notification process that can be an important step to that. So uh, residents can talk to city government. They can be clear what questions they can ask, how long the process is, and if they, how they can protest it if, if necessary. Because I, I don't want them to fully protest. Uh, I, I like the digital divide ideas, but to have the options available, that's the key. That's what we have to trust and learn and make that clear. So I'll be talking with city government more in the future. I wanted to make clear with yourselves what I think we really need to be working on. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Commissioner Caballero's computer has frozen. So I'll step in for now. Next speaker. Are there we do any? not have any more speakers right now. Okay, so that moves us over to item three, uh, deferrals and removals. Uh, is there anything that we are deferring and removal, removing colleagues? Seeing none, we'll now move over to item four, the consent calendar. And with that, I yield the floor back to Chair Caballero. Felt like Steve Bono for a second, just stepping in. Apologies for that. Uh, apparently bad internet connection. Uh, looking very much to coming back to City Hall for these meetings in the future. Um, so number four, consent calendar. Uh, we have four items. Um, or I'm sorry, five items on the consent calendar tonight. So uh, um, commissioners, do we have any items that um, are requested to remove from the consent calendar and move to the public hearing? And they will be heard in the order. And I, Sylvia, I see your hand. I'm just uh, going to check with commissioners really quickly. And it looks like we have one speaker on the consent calendar. Um, Mr. Beekman. So I'm going to recognize Sylvia first, and then I'll go ahead and recognize um, Mr. Beekman. Thank you, Chair Caballero and members of the commissioner. This is Sylvia Doe, Division Manager with Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. I just wanted to provide a brief update on item 4E on the consent calendar, and this is for file number CP21-004. And as staff emailed you earlier this afternoon with an updated resolution. I just wanted to point out for the record that there's a update to condition number 6B for that conditional use permit. And it reflects um, the hours of operation. And specifically, it modifies the last sentence of condition 6B, which now reads, amplified sound shall not occur after 11 p.m. from Sundays to Thursdays and not occur after midnight on Fridays and Saturdays. That concludes staff's update on that item. Thank you. Thank you. And um, staff, can we find out from Mr. Beekman if there's a specific item that he'd like to speak on? If so, we will probably need to pull that item from consent and have it heard book hearing. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to uh, comment on the approval of the meeting minutes of the month of May. Okay, um, I actually don't believe we need to pull that item then from consent. Um, so we'll go ahead and take public comment at, the, at this time for two minutes from Mr. Beekman. And then um, hopefully we'll have a motion for items uh, for A through E. So go ahead and give Mr. Beekman two minutes. Go ahead, I'm muted. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Blair Beekman. I'll try to 
make this short. Um, in the approval minutes uh, for the month of May, there was, uh, and I wanted to offer that uh, the vendors union, I think has some interesting ideas. And I think uh, I just wanted to recap that I think there can be a way the vendors union can have more, much more of a voice in the future development of the process, not just in the vending issues, but perhaps in the design of the, of the complex itself. And uh, I just wanted to mention that at this time and, and offer that this is a hopeful time, uh, like with what uh, downtown Google has done, it can be the same sort of process and good luck how we do that. I wanted to quickly add also that, um, yeah, with um, the notification process of 4 and 5G, I hope it's a process that we can line up between city government, uh, Verizon, the, the telecoms themselves and local community, we all line up together. That's our innovative uh, future and how we bridge the digital divide. And uh, it's our good practices and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Um, so we, uh, I don't know if Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Bonilla um, acknowledged that uh, Commissioner Oliverio and Commissioner Lardinois joined us while I was uh, <laughs> having my technical difficulties. So I wanna go ahead and make sure that they uh, are acknowledged as being present now. Um, so items uh, 4A is review and approval of action minutes from the May 12th and May 26th meeting. Item 4B is CPA 89-053-01. Item uh, 4C is CP19-033, and item 4D is CP21-001, and item 4E is CP21-004. And at this time, I'd like to re recognize uh, Commissioner Torrens. Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, make a motion to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. And we have a second by Commissioner Oliverio and Commissioner Lardinois has his hand raised. Uh, not a big deal, but I was here during the roll call earlier. Apologies, I don't think we heard, uh, maybe your sound wasn't on. Yeah, maybe uh, so. Okay, great. So uh, we have a uh, motion and a second on the uh, floor. Would either uh, Commissioner Torrens and Commissioner Oliverio like to speak to their motion? No, no, thank you. No. Okay, great. Let's take a roll call vote on items 4A and 4E. Uh, Vice Chair Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Casey. Aye. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Lardinois. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Torrens. Aye. And Chair Caballero is also an aye. And we'll just pause a moment for staff to put that up on the calendar, uh, on the screen. And at this time, I'd also like to make the announcement that the sign language interpreter will be leaving the meeting. Thank you very much, Interpreter Rita. Okay. Danielle or Jennifer, um, are we gonna be casting the votes today or not? Yes, um, staff is loading it now. It's one Great, second. okay, thank you. And the consent calendar passes unanimously with no changes. Um, okay, so we have item five, which is the public hearing. And um, item 5A is PP21-005. Um, and the project manager is Alec Hughes. So I'd like to um, turn it over to Alex and um, open the public hearing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, staff has some slides to share on this. Can I screen share? Thank you. And you can see this now, correct? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair and Planning Commissioners. My name is Alexander Hughes, Planner with PBCE, and I'm the Project Manager for this Palm Broker Zoning Update. First, a quick summary of the background for this work. In October of 2020, during the Rules and Open Government Committee meeting, staff was directed to align the conditional use permit process for Palm brokers with that of the determination of public convenience for or necessity for off sale of alcohol contained in the municipal code. 
This direction was meant to address the concentration of pawnbrokers near sensitive uses and or in traditionally marginalized communities. The existing ordinance currently limits pawnbroker businesses to no more than six in the city. A pawnbroker use requires a conditional use permit to operate, but the conditional use permit does not address issues of concentration or proximity to sensitive uses. The proposed ordinance, however, would maintain the limit of no more than six pawnbrokers within the city, maintain the need for a conditional use permit, and require additional findings to be made by the governing body under the conditional use permit process. The proposed ordinance does not set a hard limitation on where a pawnbroker use may locate but it does add language to mitigate concentration of pawnbrokers. The decision-making body would need to consider a proposed location and determine if it falls within 500 feet of an existing pawnbroker and if it creates a con concentration of more than three pawnbroker uses, and that if more than three pawnbrokers are within 1,000 feet of the proposed location, that the proposed will not adversely affect peace, morals, or welfare, impair the utility, or value of property or be detrimental to the public health, safety, or general, we general welfare of other persons in the vicinity. If the proposal falls within 500 feet of the uses listed here, which there are many, or if the chief of police determines based on quantifiable information that the proposed is detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare of persons located in the area or if it would increase the severity of existing law enforcement or public nuisance problems, then the decision-making body must find that the building's location and situation or orientation does not adversely affect the area or nearby uses. Staff analyzed the criteria discussed and found that the majority of San Jose would trigger the need for these additional findings. However, there are approximately 407 parcels that do not trigger that need. Proposed locations would be forwarded to SJPD for analysis so that findings can be made under this ordinance during the conditional use permit process. Because there is a maximum of six pawnbroker licenses and there are 407 parcels which may support a pawnbroker use without the need for the additional findings under this ordinance proposal, this ordinance as proposed should not significantly affect existing or future pawnbroker businesses. For a public outreach, staff created a dedicated project webpage with staff contact info. Staff noticed the public hearing uh, to the city's website, published this work in the San Jose Post record, emailed and called a list of interested groups and individuals, including the six existing businesses and tentative licensees, and staff has been available to respond to questions and comments. Staff recommend that the Planning Commission recommend the City Council adopt this ordinance amending Chapter 20.80 specific use regulations to add Part 11.5 to add the additional criteria discussed for issuing a conditional use permit for pawn shops and pawnbrokers. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I see hands, uh, Commissioner Oliveru and then Commissioner Casey. Thank you, Chair. Um, staff, um, I believe is there four pawn shops in the city today out of the possible six? I believe that's correct, yes. And do you have a map of where the existing ones are today? Uh, not on me right now, no. Would you be able to describe where they are? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. What, and you're saying the existing, what's proposed would not force the closure of an existing one? No, it wouldn't. Okay. And then uh, part of the reason I believe that there was this, uh, and I'm curious, um, the rules committee um, made the direction and not the full city council? Yeah, that's correct. Is that standard? I'm not sure. And then, um, so again, I, I think there was this, there's a perception or, a, a, or there's published articles that uh, crime is generated from pawn shops. Is that the major concern? 
I believe that was the concern in the memo that prompted this work. Um, it was based on other cities that aren't San Jose, so it didn't speak, you know, to our particular circumstance. I, I mean, certainly, um, pawn shops are probably not the majority of where uh, physical items are sold today um, from individuals, whether they're legitimately they own them or stolen. Um, I would imagine the internet is probably the primary place where these items are exchanged. Uh, and I could name any number of uh, internet locate, uh, internet websites, et cetera. Um, I think pawn shops do instead actually offer a one place stop for law enforcement to examine the inventory of what's at a pawn shop versus examining every household in the city. So I'm just, I'm not really sure if the, you know, uh, the, the original notion puts up with what, you know, how things can be distributed today. But um, I, I would re really love to see a map of the existing locations or addresses of the existing locations. I think I know there's one, I think there's one downtown. Um, maybe it's on Post Street or it moved to Santa Cla I can't remember where it was, but I'm not familiar with the other ones. And I'm, I'll pass to Chair, thank you. I'm looking it up right now, so we'll have that for you. Okay, so at this time, actually, I'm going to move to public comment, and then we'll come back to commissioner questions and um, uh, before we close the public hearing. So um, we do have one uh, person who has their hand raised for public comment. We'll do two. Jane, you are unmuted. Hi, Jan, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't know I could, I had to unmute too. Um, my name is Jan Schneider. I own RJ Jewelry and Loan. We are the pawn shop that was located downtown. We are now located and have been for the last two and a half years in Mi Pueblo Shopping Center on King and Story. Um, I can tell you if you want to save some time where the other pawn shops are. We actually hold two licenses. There's one on Tully Road across from, um, it's right off of King. And there's one on West San Carlos that used to be Big Ben's, which is now called Buy, Sell, Loan. So those are the four. Um, I sent all of you an email several weeks ago when this item was originally on the agenda to be heard. Unfortunately, because of what happened at BTA, the meeting was canceled. I hope you all had time to read that memo. I, I, I'm really disturbed by this. Um, there is a problem with stolen property that Commissioner Oliverio alluded to, but it's not coming into pawn shops. In my shop alone, we have approximately 5,000 loans at this time. We have over $1.2 million loaned out. That's to citizens of San Jose that are living paycheck to paycheck and need our services to borrow money. Um, it's easy to say that we wouldn't be affected because we have our location. But if my lease is up and my landlord did not want to renew or I wanted to move my shop, I'm not sure that would be possible if this ordinance goes into effect, the, the increased uh, CUP requirements. Um, we report to a state database, as I said in my email, every single transaction on a daily basis. Since 2005, when the database uh, went live, I have not had one single hit on a transaction in my store. Yeah, Again, your time is up. Thank you so much. And uh, we did receive your comments and your emails. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other hands on this item. I'll go back uh, to uh, uh, staff. And I do see uh, Michael has uh, his hand up. Yeah, hi. So just one um, response to Commissioner Oliveria's question about the rules committee. So we do get um, occasionally things, council people will send memos to the rules committee directing staff to do stuff. Um, we respond with a, um, we call it a red, green, blue 
red, green, yellow memo or work analysis where we either say, red, we do not agree that we should do this for various reasons. It could violate laws or whatnot. It's a bad idea. Green, we have the existing resources. It's not a heavy lift. We can just take this work on, in which case we do that. And that was the case with this ordinance work. Or it's yellow, in which case we say we could do this work, but we need additional resources. Send it to council priority setting. And then the council would have to prioritize the work to for us staff to do the work. This was determined to be a green item, which was simple, and staff would just go ahead and do it. So it did come out of rules. Commissioners, do we have any additional questions? Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. I heard the um, uh, speaker mention three locations. Uh, was there staff? Was there a fourth? I know someone was looking it up. Tully and King, West San Carlos. I believe she said that it was the Mee Pueblo Shopping Center or different shopping center? She was at the Mee Pueblo Shopping Center. I'm seeing one on Hamilton Road, although that may be in Campbell. What, what, what intersection? Um, that's a good question. Let's see. Security and loans at 450 East Campbell. Bring this one in. Or sorry, 450 East Hamilton. It's near the Home Depot. So Campbell. Yep, or yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's Campbell. I apologize for that. This way. And then a question for staff. Are, are these um, uh, sensitive uses that you proposed in this ordinance different than cannabis? Yes. Yeah. It mimics yeah. the uh, off sale of alcohol provision in the municipal code, but there are some uses there that are not in the cannabis provision. So, uh, but I remember this uh, proving off sale uh, 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 liquor or beer wine at gas stations adjacent or pretty close to parks. So, is it you sure? I mean, it mimics. Yeah, I just want to clarify. So this doesn't prevent these businesses from going in any location. So it doesn't say it cannot be near a park. It just says if it is near a park, you have to make the additional findings that mm. the use isn't going to be detrimental to that park, that it's situated in a way that's not detrimental to that sensitive use. So yeah, absolutely. if it was a hard limitation, like it can't be within 500 feet of a park, then that would actually would significantly limit where these businesses can locate. Um, but in this case, this ordinance is, is really just adding an additional level of review through that conditional use permit process that they already have to go through, not adding any more restrictions. The only hard restriction is from three of them concentrating in close proximity to each other. That's the only hard restriction proposed here. And to your point, we have had this process for many years for alcohol and, and you know, um, off sale of alcohol does get approved in the city right. with these same findings. Thanks, Martina. And then one more question then. Um, then is it for cannabis, uh, the, the limitations that we have or on sensitive areas, are those suggestions or absolutely not? They're absolutely the not. Yeah. Yes, they're absolutely no's. Got it. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, Jared Hart, uh, Division Manager with, uh, pl uh, with Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio, just wanted to um, respond to your question on that fourth. Um, pawn shop, I believe it's uh, on Tully Road, Best Collateral Pawn Shop is, I believe is the fourth um, pawn shop. So in, if in I may ask, question. So I guess there's two on Tully, right? There's one on Tully and King and one on Tully elsewhere? Correct. Got it. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Garcia. So you know, it, when I looked at this, it seemed like a pretty simple and straightforward no brainer, right? But Commissioner Oliverio did, does bring a valid point. And I think this gives the impression that we're agreeing with the fact that pawn shops bring crime. And, and I, I don't know that that's a given fact. Uh, I'm, I am surprised that the original memo from October didn't have a map in it. Um, and if we're regulating these types of businesses, do we also regulate um, payday loans and how close they can be to each other and what neighborhoods those are located in? Because uh, payday loans uh, from a, on, on average, I think have more of a negative impact than 
than pawn shops do, right? So are we regulating the location of those places as well? Or is it just pawn shops because it sounded like a good idea? I mean, I realized that the Department of Justice already has a lot of measures in place. And are, are, is it really necessary to go above and beyond what they've already established as guidelines? Is my question that I'm asking. Yeah. I can speak to that. I'm sorry. And I realize I forgot to introduce myself. I'm very bad about that. Martina Davis, supervising planner, uh, PVCE. So yes, we actually do regulate uh, uh, the cash loan, um, the short-term loan type businesses um, already. So there, there are limitations in the zoning ordinance on those. And if you'd like to know what they are, I can look it up real quick and give you kind of a summary. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how we regulate them, but we do have special zoning regulations for those uses. Okay, thank you. Okay, Vice Chair Bonilla. I guess my question is, it's a, it's a little bit to piggyback off of uh, the comments that were just made. Uh, are we, what was the genesis of this, this concept? Are we experiencing some sort of, uh, you know, pawn shop uh, crime spree that, that, that we're not hearing in the press and in the public? What, what, walk me uh, a little bit through the thinking. Anyone? Yeah, sorry. Um, my understanding is that uh, that the pawn shops were just uh, a possible site that could have negative impacts that we just aren't controlling right now uh, for their concentration, and that there was a concern that should these pawnbrokers be able to concentrate that um, that there could be negative effects through that. And then this is just meant to uh, prevent them from you know, aggregating in tight vicinity of one another. Do we have a history of that negative effect uh, in, in San Jose since pawn shops were a thing in the city? I'm not sure. Does, is anyone? Yeah, so I mean, specifically, no, there are only six licenses in the city. So right. we, we have not seen much of an issue with, let's say, concentration. Um, it was a concern raised by some council members who brought it to the committee who, who directed this work to occur. So um, I would say the best, the best explanation is kind of how this occurred is that community, that a memo from the rules committee from the, the council members that was then forwarded as a work item for staff. Yeah, th this to me kind of falls under that category of pie in the sky, you know, council members throwing out memos and Commissioner Oliveira remembers the good old days, uh, people have ideas, they talk to each other, today we're going to build a rocket that's going to take you to Mars, let's just study it in 15 paragraphs and it, we're never going to get to Mars, right, uh, unless you're Elon Musk, but I, I agree too with Commissioner Garcia, look, I'm putting everything on the table. In my mind, yes, uh, over concentration would be a problem. We're talking about six total uh, licenses in the city of a million. We're talking about, if I heard correctly, four that are actually licenses that are being utilized. Uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Garcia in the sense that I don't necessarily like the characterization that somehow pawn shops attract crime. Well, they do if they're saturated and specifically, you know, put into high crime areas. I myself am a beneficiary of pawn shops growing up as a kid. Uh, pawn shops were micro loans before micro loans were a thing. So uh, I, I think we have to be really careful about what we're saying here. Uh, and, 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 and to me, I, I'm data driven. And tonight on this topic, there have been a ton of questions that have gone out and, and the answers have been minimal, uh, no map. Uh, this is a pretty big decision to make in terms of the the tone that we're setting and, and, and the answers aren't necessarily there. And then the, the answers that we are getting don't demonstrate that this is an issue we need to run to and, and, and correct because it doesn't seem to be anything to correct. Um, so th th those are my thoughts. I, I think this is one, I'm gonna steal a phrase here from Commissioner Torrens at a past meeting. I think this is somewhat half-baked. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this is planning's problem. I, I don't think you did this. I think this is one, again, I go back to my earlier point. This is one of those moments where the council is talking, memos are flying, ideas are going everywhere, but where they really need to go. Um, we're fixing, fixing a problem that doesn't exist. So 
those are my thoughts. I'll make life easy for everyone. I'm going to vote no, so heads up. Okay. Um, I do see that uh, Jan Schneider has raised her hand again. Um, public comment, you've, you've provided your two minutes, so um, I won't be calling on you again. Um, but thank you for being here. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio, go ahead and uh, call on you again, and then hopefully we can close the public hearing and request a motion. So, um, staff, for example, massage parlors, um, do we have an ordinance that um, avoids concentration? No, we do not. So massage parlors are considered a personal service, so much like a nail salon or a tattoo parlor, or other type, those types of, of personal services. So they, they don't have special regulations in that manner. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, what, for a lot of the comments made by other commissioners and uh, Commissioner Boni, I just, uh, I'm not seeing the, the need slash data slash whatever. And the fact that, you know, you know, this is something in my perspective should be vetted at the council to direct staff to, um, you know, work on an ordinance. I know there's the red, uh, red, yellow, green, but it's it's coming to our level and it's we're wondering about basic, simple questions. No offense to staff. I think it's the origins of the uh, of the memo. So I'm, I'm in, not inclined to support it either. Okay, so at this time, seeing no further hands from commissioners for questions for staff, I will close the public hearing and request a motion from my fellow commissioners. Uh, Vice Chair Bonilla. I motion that we not approve uh, staff's recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion in the second uh, by Commissioner Bonilla and then Commissioner Oliverio or Vice Chair Bonilla. Uh, Vice Chair Bonilla, would you like to speak to your, uh, any further to your uh, motion? Yeah, no, I think that this is more big picture, although I don't blame planning for being in this predicament because I worked in the building and I know how that works. I, I think there were a lot of questions that were asked tonight and there were a lot of non-answers, loose answers I'm not going to pick on anyone. I know there's a lot going on in the world, but I think for something of this magnitude, I mean, a question of how many and where is pretty straightforward, something we kind of should have anticipated. Um, so in the future, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, Vice Chair, sorry, Commissioner Oliverio, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you, but I appreciate uh, the, uh, Commissioner Bonilla's uh, mentioning of his personal uh, benefiting, as many people do, and uh, the applicant, uh, Jan Schneider, who spoke about how many people they interact with and uh, no justice department hits or whatever the terminology was pretty strong. So um, I think the concern needs to be with other distribution methods. Okay, so the motion on the table is to um, not approve staff recommendation. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Um, Vice Chair Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Casey. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Lardinois. I'm sorry, the motion is to deny the staff recommendation? Yes. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Torrance. And I am also an aye. Okay, so that motion, uh, so the staff recommendation is denied. Um, and we'll go ahead and I guess forward that to the city council with our comments, correct? Yes, that's correct. So your recommendation and comments will be forwarded to the council for their consideration. Okay, great. All right, so then we'll move on to item, um, uh, Six, which is to continue the general plan hearing cycle one for 2021. Um, so at this point, I'm opening the general plan. Um, there are no items on the general plan consent calendar. So we'll move to item 8A, which is GP19-007, which is a city initiated general plan amendment and staff presentation from Joe Sordi. Good evening, Chair and Commissioner. So my name is Joe Sorty, Project Manager with the Planning Division. 
uh, staff from the housing department is also in attendance tonight. I, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll just go ahead and proceed with my verbal presentation. Uh, before you this evening is a recommendation to the city council regarding a city initiated general plan amendment to the envisioned San Jose 2040 general plan to change the land use designation from mixed use neighborhood to urban residential on an approximately 5.93 acre site located at 2078 and zero Evans Lane. The proposed general plan amendment would change the development density on the site from a maximum of 30 dwelling units per acre and would allow future development up to a maximum of 95 dwelling units per acre. The subject property is owned by the city and this proposed general plan amendment has been brought forward by the city's housing department. The proposal is intended to establish a higher density residential designation to fulfill the city's long-term vision for the site and facilitate future development of affordable housing. A portion of the site is currently occupied by the interim emergency housing project approved in spring, 20, spring of 2020 in response to the COVID-19 emergency and the city's shelter crisis declaration. The site is located within the Kirtner Light Rail Urban Village and is less than a half mile away from the Kirtner Light Rail Station. The site is bounded by the Catalonia Apartments to the north, the Willow Glen Estates Mobile Home Park to the east, the Evans Lane Wellness and Recovery Center to the south and a combination of land uses to the west across Evans Lane, including the Open Faith Bible Church and the River Glen Mobile Home Park. The current general plan designation of mixed use neighborhood supports development such as townhouses, small lot, single family residences, and can also be applied to existing neighborhoods historically developed with a wide variety of housing types. The proposed amendment would change the general plan designation on the site to urban residential, allowing for much more dense development. This designation allows for medium to high density residential development and a fairly broad range of commercial uses, including retail, offices, hospitals, and private community gathering facilities within identified urban villages or in areas in close proximity to an urban village or transit station. In addition to raising the proposed density on the site to 95 dwelling units to the acre, the change to urban residential would allow development of up to a 4.0 floor area ratio. The proposed amendment is consistent with major strategy number three of the general plan, which encourages focused growth in established growth areas because the project is located within the Kirtner Light Rail Transit Village and is less than one half mile to the Kirtner Light Rail Station. The project also conforms to several other policies relating to achievement of that city's housing goals, fulfillment of the, of the city's regional fair share of low-income housing, and maximizing the use of infrastructure, including fixed transit facilities. A virtual community meeting was held for this proposal on November 16th, 2020. This meeting was noticed to all owners and tenants within a thousand square foot radius of the subject site. Uh, no comments were received for the mail public notifications, but several comments were received during the community meeting regarding potential for site flooding, pedestrian safety, uh, future use of density bonus, future parking reductions, and the city's future RFP process. Responses to these concerns have been included in the staff report. Uh, an initial study and negative declaration were prepared for this general plan amendment in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. These documents were circulated for public comment from June 12th to July 1st, 2020, and no public comments were received. The negative declaration states that the proposed general plan amendment will have no significant impact on the environment. As discussed in the staff report, the project would encourage focused growth into an established growth area, increase the production of lower income housing, and further the city's ability to achieve its regional fair share of low income housing. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council that they approve both this negative declaration and the general plan amendment. And this concludes staff's report. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to go ahead. Oh, uh, Rima, we'll go ahead and recognize you. Thank you, Chair Rima Mahmoud with the Planning Department. Just a quick correction. We did receive comments on the initial study and negative declaration that was uh, published. One, uh, we got two letters. One was from the County Roads and Airports, and the second letter was from Valley Water. Uh, the comments were, uh, the County Roads comment was about the intersection level of service counts, and our response was that it will be addressed when future development was proposed at the site. Valley Water had some corrections to the information we had in the initial study, and none of those um, corrections affected the analysis of the initial study. The responses to comments were also posted on the city's website. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rima. So at this time, we'll go ahead and move to public comment. Um, if uh, folks would like to make public comment on item 8A, you'll have two minutes. Please raise your hand now. And I'm seeing no hands raised. So we'll go ahead and move to uh, commissioner questions for staff. Uh, commissioner Oliverio. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I have a bit of history with this um, parcel since um, we originally had planned to do uh, low income housing, but then the redevelopment agency died. And so then this parcel was fallow. And uh, I actually, where is it? I have um, in July of 2016, no, pardon me, June 25th, 2016, I had a memo put forward that went to city council we had two developers come forward who spoke in favor of building uh, permanent housing here. Uh, but the city council thought it would be a good idea to build um, some low cost tent type of encampment uh, instead of doing permanent housing because it would take too long. So now we're in 2021 and we're doing the same thing I proposed in 2016. So with great pride, I will make a motion to approve Second. Okay, we'll go ahead and. Uh... No, my apologies, Chair I okay. withdraw my second. Uh, give you a second. <laughs> I, 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 uh, we'll hold motions until we close the yeah. public hearing or yeah. close the the uh, the hearing for this item. Um, but I'm not seeing actually any other hands uh, from commissioners. So, uh, po public hearing is closed on item 8A, and uh, we have a motion from Commissioner Oliverio and a second from Vice Chair Bonilla. Uh, Commissioner uh, Oliverio, Vice Chair Bonilla, I'd like to speak to the motion. I'm fine. Just a long time coming. Should have been done in 2016. Thank you. Uh, as I said it with the previous item, sometimes some crazy things happen on the 18th floor. This is a great example of that, uh, as was the earlier issue. So happy to support this item. Great. Um, okay. So do we have any other further discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing no hands from the commissioners, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote on this item. Vice Chair Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Casey. Aye. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Lardinois. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. And Commissioner Torrens. Aye. aye. Okay. And uh, Chair Gavallero is also an aye. Thank you. That item passes unanimously. And we'll pause for a moment for staff to show the vote. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to item uh, 8B, which is GP19-08 and H20-004, um, which is a general plan amendment. Um, uh, and um, today we have Jessica Setuan and Angela Wang as our project managers. So presentation from staff. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Angela Wong, the Planning Project Manager with the Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. And before I start, I would like to share my screen for PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So um, before you this evening is a project including two planning applications. One is a general plan amendment and the other is a site development permit. The, uh, the project- can, can we ask that you put this in um, presentation mode just so that the font is larger? Uh, let me see. There you go. Oh, okay. Yep, much better. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, and so as you can see, the project is located at the southwest corner of uh, South Elmerton Boulevard and Wasway. And the current general plan land use designation is public quasi public. So this is uh, the, uh, with this color, the light blue. And the proposed general land use, uh, general plan land use designation is downtown is the color 
Kama is shown on the left hand side here. So, and as you can see, the uh, the proposed area is also includes the existing uh, the locust street. The project uh, the project site is within the downtown growth area. The change of the land use designation to downtown is. Uh, consistent with our general plan major strategies and land use policies. The conversion of the land use designation from PQP to downtown would increase the potential number of jobs that the land could support. And the other planning application is the site development permits to allow the development of two 20-story uh, office towers. So uh, before I get into the details of the project design, I would like to point out that the site development permit area is slightly from the uh, general plan amendment area. So the, as you can see, so one of the houses along South Amazon Boulevard is excluded from the site development permit area. And also, of, uh, also the Locust Street will be vacated as part of the project area, and also as a project condition. So the site development site development permit includes the demolition of the 16 existing single family homes here. And also include the demolition or relocation or removal of these five single family homes along this street. And these five uh, uh, single family homes are considered contributors to a candidate city landmark district. So therefore, the demolition or relocation of those structures would result in a significant and unavoidable impact to the historic resource and a significant contribution to a, a cumulative cultural impact. Therefore, a statement of overriding consideration is required for environmental impacts that cannot be uh, reduced to a less than significant level. The project also includes the removal of four existing trees within the project area due to the proposed underground parking. Uh, so this proposed, the project proposed two 20 story office towers with ground floor retail. The project features a parcel connecting the uh, pedestrian and vehicular circulation from South Amazon Boulevard to uh, Guadalupe Trail and also to Wasway. And the project has a, a 35 foot riparian setback. I mean, one of the towers is setback from uh, 35 foot to the riparian corridor. And this line shows uh, where the project is within the 100 foot setback area. It's uh, most likely just a small portion of the tower. And we go to. The project is consistent with the proposed downtown land use designation, which supports a wide range of commercial uses, including retail and office. The project also conforms with all, develop, uh, all applicable development standards for downtown primary commercial zoning district. The project is also consistent with the riparian policy, which allows a reduced riparian setback for some circumstance and the project qualifies uh, with some of those uh, circumstances. The project design is also consistent with the downtown design guidelines. And finally, the city of San Jose is the lead agency for the project prepared a supplemental environmental impact report. Now I'm going to turn it over to the environmental project manager, Adam Peterson, to discuss the environmental review for the project. <coughs> Thank you, Angela. Good evening, Chair Caballero, members of the San Jose Planning Commission. As Angela noted, I'm a contract environmental planner for the city of San Jose. The city of San Jose managed and prepared a supplemental environmental impact report to the downtown strategy 2040 EIR. There was a notice of preparation that was circulated on June 8th of 2020. Environmental impacts were mitigated to less than significant levels in the areas of air quality, biological resources, and noise. Chief uh, mitigation measures in these subject areas included the, con the construction operation plan to minimize emissions, bat bird and bat surveys, uh, locally native landscaping, and irrigation monitoring related to, related to biological resources. 
Related to noise mitigation measures included a construction noise logistics plan and also vibration management and monitoring plan. There were significant and unavoidable impacts related to cultural resources. Alternatives in the supplemental EIR evaluated, uh, evaluated alternatives for preservation, a parcel, pr partial preservation, relocation, and an increased setback as well. But the alternatives found, uh, the alternatives analysis found that the project objectives would not be achieved. Next slide, Angela. The supplemental EIR circulated from March 1st to April 15th. The city received comments from Caltrans, the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, Santa Clara Valley Water District, Preservation Action Council of San Jose, and the San Jose Downtown, San Jose Downtown Association, and also Kaya Irvin. The comments received did not identify any issues of sufficiency with the draft supplemental EIR, so no new mitigation was needed and no circulation of the EIR was necessary. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation of the environmental topics. Thank you, Adam. So as discussed in the staff report, the project is consistent with the general plan, zoning code, and applicable city council policies. Therefore, uh, staff recommends that the planning commission recommend the city council to certify the SEIR and approve the general plan amendment and site development permit. This concludes the staff's presentation. Do we have an applicant um, uh, presentation on this one? Madam Chair, Mark Tresini, uh, the applicant on the project. Okay, so we have five minutes for the applicant presentation. Very good. Uh, Madam Chair, I would like to um, thank staff for their uh, diligence in, in work on this project and their uh, clear uh, staff report presented this evening. But given the, the complexity of the, the project, I, I would love to have our architect uh, C2K architecture walk the commission through a little bit more detail with respect to the design as it relates to the um, riparian core and the um, uh, intersection of Laws Way and Almaden Boulevard. So if we can ask the C2K to uh, get on the, the Zoom call here and provide a brief presentation. Um, it looks like Tim, Tim from C2K has unmuted, but um, I'd like to make your five minute presentation. We can see. Chair, could you ask Tim to speak? Uh, yeah, if you are, <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <clears throat> he appears to be having some technical difficulties with his microphone, perhaps. Yeah. and. Just you know, we can see your text message app. You might want to put that away. It's a public <laughs> meeting. That would be great. <laughs> Tim, you had it up before. Yeah. I would. I would suggest um, unmuting Tim if you can't. Do you want to give Tim a couple minutes? Maybe break for a couple minutes to give him space. Happen. Couple meetings ago, too, technical difficulties. Your call, suggest. Okay, well, it looks like uh, he's got the presentation uh, up. Um, do you want to test your mic, Tim? We can't hear you, but we, um, I maybe we can pause for a minute or two so that you can call in.
and maybe the applicant can call the architect and uh, to the you know comments and come back in two okay. minutes. That would be fine. We'll do that. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and go to public comment on this project and then we'll come back to the applicant um, and um, the applicant can, this is not normal procedure, but the applicant can then do their five minute presentation and five minutes to respond to public comment um, if there are any. So at this point, this would be the opportunity for folks in the public to raise their hands um, and they'll have two minutes to speak. Okay, you are unmuted, Shani. Please proceed with your comment. Thank you. I thought we had two minutes. Okay, good. Please start. <laughs> we can hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, now we can. Right. Good evening, Chair Cabrera and Commissioners. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Uh, in 2016, the city adopted the Riparian Corridor Protection and Bird Safety Design Policy. Three years later, in 2019, they strengthened this policy when council adopted the downtown design standards and guidelines. In the downtown design, standards and guidelines, standards are mandatory requirements, whereas guidelines are strongly recommended. The following mandatory standards should be applied to bird safety at this project. Use a bird safety treatment, which is defined in the guidelines and standards, on facades within 300 feet of a riparian corridor that have 50% or more glazed surface. There's other standards that apply to glazing that is visible from a green roof and standards for glazed walkways. So the EIR proposes to comply with the 2016 policy as it should, but the project bird safe design measures do not comply with the requirements of the downtown design standards and guidelines. Instead, they propose to protect birds using bird friendly glass as feasible. That is not good enough. So we're asking you to make sure that as the project moves forward, it actually complies with the requirements of the downtown design standards and guidelines. One other thing, which I just wanted to say that they should keep 50 feet from the creek the way that uh, the Google project is doing, that would make a much better project for the community and for the creek. And uh, as is the 35 feet is really not protecting the environment to the extent that it should be protected. Thank you for your time. Uh, Katya, you are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good evening, planning commissioners and staff. I'm Katya Urban, a resident of district three and I'm also involved in the Loma Prieta Sierra Club Water Committee, but mostly I'm speaking today as a resident of San Jose. I'm concerned about the impacts of this project together with the Almaden office project across the street on the city and on the Guadalupe River. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> These projects are both huge buildings that will create a massive block that might feel imposing and not welcoming and will feel out of place. The impacts of these huge office towers with reduced riparian setbacks and all the people and cars they will bring will be wide ranging, but mostly I'm concerned about the river and the important habitat the river provides. I have, and the Sierra Club has submitted comments during the environmental review process I'm concerned about the impacts of construction on dewatering and changing runoff conditions, which might impact water quality in the river. And that includes increased toxins, temperature increases and in sediment. Uh, there will also be a loss of habitat due to significant removal of mature trees and increased human presence, lighting, noise, et cetera animals living along the river and migrating species such as birds certainly use the yards of the houses as an extension of the riparian habitat. So planting new trees in restricted spaces will never mitigate for the habitat impacts. 
and so at least mitigation needs to be implemented as near as possible to the site and needs to be monitored. These huge projects will have some other impacts. I feel the applicants should provide more benefits to the city in return like Google did. I suggest hey, they commit to sorry, doing on-site- Sorry, your time is up. Uh, Juliana, you are unmuted. Go ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to support and echo the comments made by Shani and Katya. Um, I really do think we need to be focusing more on uh, avoidance strategies than rather than mitigation. I am really concerned with the impacts this will have to our waterways and natural habitat. We really do need to protect our already diminishing natural spaces. Um, and I would like to say that this, pro this Wasway project along with the Almaden office together is half the Google Office project. So why not apply the same standards and community benefit requirements? Thank you. Okay, so seeing no further public comment, um, we will try our presentation again from the applicant. Um, Mark and Madam Chair, my understanding is Tim is ready to go. So I'll put myself back on mute. Thank you. Great, Tim, you wanna go ahead and share your screen again? Sure, sure, happy to. And we can hear you, wonderful. Good, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Okay, everyone should be able to see this now as well. Yes. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so sorry about that earlier, um, had some technical difficulties. My name is Tim Boylan, I'm a designer with C2K. Um, I've been working on this project since the beginning, so I'm pretty excited to be presenting it today. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, from the get-go, we did a lot of site analysis um, on this particular project um, and tried to, we identified a lot of sort of challenges associated with this um, project site, but there's also a lot of opportunities. So we get, it's the southern most um, uh, southernmost site within the urban uh, downtown core. Um, so it's sort of the tip of the spear um, down here further south. And we're also really close to the freeways. Um, so we have a lot of uh, eyes on this particular site. Um, so we really saw this as an opportunity to create a landmark gateway um, building um, within the city of San Jose. Um, looking at the existing city skyline, I think what really stood out to us was um, because of the height limitations set by the airport, there's a really strong uh, horizontal plane across the entire skyline. Um, and a lot of the existing towers are sort of bigger and blocky. Um, so we saw this as an opportunity for us to uh, do something different with the, um, the, the skyline presence of our project. We did a lot of mapping studies. Um, we also did some more conceptual studies. Um, we started to conceptualize this building, um, really being drawn to uh, these compelling images of waterfalls and rivers, um, thinking about our project as sort of the, um, the boundary marker for the south side of downtown San Jose. Um, and the way we, can, we uh, uh, created that conceptual idea within architecture is by creating this curving form on the roof line, which really becomes a landmark symbol um, for this project. Um, this is a view looking north from I-280 East and you can see the amount of um, eyes that are going to be on this project, um, and the curves on the top of this, uh, the curves on the top of the building really create this iconic form. This is a look a view from looking west from Albaden Boulevard. Um, we pushed up the corners of the building to create these iconic peaks. Um, and this is south from Albaden Boulevard. You can see how um, the curving top of the building starts to transition into these strong. Um, vertical pieces that again kind of harken back to this idea of falling water. This is east from Wadsway. You can see the river behind us here. Um, and then again, this is an aerial view from Wadsway. You can see how the we're starting to uh, we offset the two towers to kind of create this idea of a pocket where um, our build are the plaza in between our two buildings could be an ending point um, for the walkway along the river here. Um, this is another aerial view, kind of looking at the plaza um, in between our two towers. 
Uh, what I'll highlight here is that we've really intentionally tried to carve away large portions of our building around the existing um, property, uh, really to give a lot, as much open space as we possibly can around this open property or the, around this property. We didn't want to build a tower immediately next to our neighbor. Um, this is another view that kind of shows some of that carving away on the garage specifically. Um, and then on, uh, next to that, uh, the plaza we've created, we've added retail spaces to really activate that plaza. Um, and those retail places carve into the building. Um, we've continued the same concept through our facades, through some of the detailing. Um, and then entrances, we've carved in these entrances to create a really grand entrance to the project um, and trying to create a plaza that would really be active and uh, lively for pe pedestrians. So moving over to um, plans, we've come consolidated a majority of our parking uh, below grade. We have four levels of below grade parking. Um, this is the first, uh, the ground floor plan. And so some of the specific things that um, have come up have to do with environmental impact. Um, and so I, for more detail on those, I would refer back to our SEIR where we, um, where we have some more specifics about that more than I can get into now. Uh, what I'll get into right now, what I would say right now is that um, the two things that I'll highlight right now are primarily lighting and um, bird safety. So for the lighting along the portion of our facade that's um, facing the Guadalupe River, we've really done everything we can to reduce that lighting. So we're not using any bright uh, lights, no glossy, reflective, transparent colors. Um, we're not proposing any lighting within the 35 foot setback we have. Um, and then the project lighting we are incorporating uh, is oriented downward and as low as possible. Um, so ultimately, the project lighting will really not be visible from the riparian corridor. Um, a lot of that has to do with how the river is much lower than our project site. And then as far as bird safety, um, we are following the, riparian, the city's riparian corridor protection and bird safety design policy. Um, so following those guidelines, we're integrating uh, bird-safe glass throughout the entire project. Um, so per those guidelines, 90% of the building facades from the ground to 40 feet high is not transparent or reflective. And then 60% of the facades above 40 feet is not transparent or reflective. We're achieving this by using bird-safe glass that's specifically designed uh, to prevent bird collisions. Um, and this glass is uh, designed to, it has an etched pattern into it so birds are uh, it's specifically designed so that birds won't run into it and will understand that it's not a, uh, it's a solid surface. Um, and we're following guidelines on that. Um, and for more details on either of those, uh, on our, the environmental impacts of this project, again, I would refer back to our uh, SEIR. Um, moving up to level two, um, office, uh, the office floor plans begin uh, start to come into play. Uh, we have some above ground parking. Dash lines are the overhangs above entries. Uh, again, level three, more above ground parking. Level four is the last level of ground above ground parking. Um, and then on level five, this terrace, this uh, the parking uh, structure turns into a terrace. Uh, and this is our typical office floor plans uh, for level six through twenty. Um, so this is the. Again, kind of the vision vision rendering we've kind of produced for the for the project. So, if there's any questions that come up, I'd be happy to try to help answer those. So, um, you have uh, three minutes left um, of the total ten, but um, since you've uh, mentioned that your presentation is done for now, why don't we go ahead and move to commissioner questions um, of the applicant or the staff? So I will call on Commissioner Larganwa first. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was curious about the state of the, you know, homes that will be demolished or moved. And I sent staff a question, got a response back that uh, you're under contract with the property owners. There's and some of the houses are owner occupied, some are rentals, some are vacant. So can you just talk about that like is under contract as in like uh if the project's approved you'll purchase the homes how does that work uh again uh mark Cersini, um i don't know if you can see me how it works is uh the contracts are are set to uh to close it has it's irrespective of the approval it's um set contracts 
And during the, the, the course of our um, <clears throat> review of this project site, which began in 2019, uh, we've met with all the property owners, indicated to those that are renting those units to make sure that they have full notice to the, to the tenants to give them more than adequate advance notice of the pending uh, development. But, uh, and in addition to that, I've also had interface with um, PAC SJ and indicated to them that there is an interest to try to uh, preserve a few homes and move them. We're fortunate one of the property owners has a site in close proximity to the project site. And we've done some evaluation as far as uh, moving a few of those homes to that site to be used as secondary dwelling units on that property. So we're open to doing that and we're going to make an, an, an effort to do that. But the, the, the closing has nothing to do with the time frame of the approval. Does that conclude your questions, Commissioner Lardenlaw? It does. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and call on Commissioner Oliverio next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to the architect or to the applicant, um, this rendering that I'm looking at right now shows your project to the right with, I would say, a, a nice unique shape that's clearly different than what the block we see downtown. But then immediately to the left, I think what you're depicting there is the Boston property site, which has, which is also along the same riparian and has, <laughs> the city's been waiting for that to get built for 25 years. Is that correct? That's, that is correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Okay, I, I just I because I you know those buildings don't exist, but I understand you're trying to show it that they they have entitlements and eventually you know they will do something. But I just wanted to make sure uh, what I was seeing is what I, I thought I was seeing. So thank you. And I guess one question for the applicant: uh, I guess the one property owner did not want to sell. Is that correct? That is correct, uh, Commissioner uh, Oliverio. Um, the the, the home is owned by family and there is an existing life estate um, with that particular home. So we're not privy to the actual interactions between the family members, but um, we have uh, approached them uh, and we've been told at this point in time, they're, they're not interested in, in selling the property. If that changes down the road, we'd be happy to uh, uh, come to the city staff with a, with a proposed modification to the site. Thanks, and I would admit that you gave a very generous setback uh, to, the, to that property. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Torrance. Thank you. Uh, well, one of my questions was answered. I feel like we were having an up moment, you know, the movie Up, right? Where the one little house remains while the, everything next to it becomes the skyscrapers. And so I was wondering about that little house, why that was preserved. Was that Pack SJ that made that happen? It sounds like it was the family that really wanted to stay there. And I hope that um, that works out. And uh, so I guess then my second my question is, uh, repeat the part, I think this is for staff, about the city being the lead agency on this. Was this city-owned land or am I thinking about the last project? Was this yes. for the public, quasi-public, or what? who owned this land previously? Those homeowners, the, the, where those homes were sitting, that's who owned it? Adam is sure. shaking his head, yes. <laughs> so uh, on Zoom, we can't see head shakes unless. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you could verbalize your response, Adam, that'd be helpful. Yeah, no problem. Just. So the question of lead agency, that's that's a CEQA, that's an environmental question. And so basically that's, you know, that's the agency that's responsible for preparing the environmental clearance document. And so in this case, you know, the city of San Jose is the lead agency because this project is in San Jose, is in, San, is in the jurisdiction of the city of San Jose. In regards to actual ownership of the properties, you know, that's a question that Mr. Tresini has, has provided the answer to. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. I still am a rookie. Um, and oh, and then just one more thing geographically, can you remind me where is the Discovery Museum in relation to this building? 
it's the little purple building that um, if you go back to the previous, um, you can kind of see it uh, in the rendering. The not, that one's not so great, yeah. but yeah, it's that little. Hard to see there's no duck in this rendering. <laughs> true, true. Um, in the in 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 the other direction, you can see it a little bigger. Okay. It's it's immediately to the north. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's going to be a neighbor because Waz Way. That's what I was like. Wait a minute, that's where the Discovery Museum is. That is okay. correct. I see it. Okay, very fun. All right. Well, thank you. The, I yield the floor. Thank you, Commissioner Torrance. So Michael was trying to show us something through his camera, little house. Oh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You all know this book, right? I was just reading this to my son the other night. This is the little house. So I guess it's the little house in the middle of a big, big city block. I heard Virginia Lee Burton a great book. <laughs> all right. And then I think 1939. And Jessica had her hand raised, but then she uh, lowered it. Did you want well, to say yeah, I just wanted to add something. Uh, Locust Street is owned by the city of San Jose. And so, oh, I'm, uh, Jessica Sophia, one um, project manager for the general plan amendment. Uh, good evening, Chair, Co Chair, and Commissioners. I just wanted to clarify that part. In addition to all the property owners there, the city of San Jose is the owner of the Locust Street portion. Thank you for that clarification. We went out of um, order to take uh, to address the um, technical issues, and I do see one hand up for public comment. So I want to give Mr. Beekman his two minutes to make his comments um, before we close the public hearing and uh, uh, take any motions from the commissioners. So uh, staff, if we could give Mr. Beekman his two minutes. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Really nice of you that you're, uh, you can allow public comment for myself. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that it's my hope that, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, as a city, you've decided that you can build these high rises, uh, no matter what uh, airport conditions may be, and that you've decided it is workable. Um, I'm okay with that. And my question is, are these buildings that are going to be built with the intentions and the deal that the airline industry basically has to change the future of their airlines and how they're designed? And that will be basically burning up more jet fuel in order for these uh, high rises to be built. I don't know if these, these are the ones that are going to be built in a, uh, I, I don't think that's a good way to work if that is the plan. And I, th I think you really have to re-question uh, the future of uh, the, south, the south takeoff uh, and landing situation um, in the future and how, the, how you build high rises uh, in that area that don't affect the south, the south, uh, south takeoff and landing times. And, uh, yeah, I hope this is applicable to this issue and maybe just lower the buildings by, you know, 50 to 100 feet. I don't know what, what is needed, uh, if it's needed, but just to acknowledge that uh, situation. Thanks for your time and uh, listening to me on this item. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael, I still see your hand up. Did you want to make additional comments or clarifications? No, I'm sorry. I'm, lo I'm lowering my hand up. No problem. Okay. So I just muted myself. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and uh, we'll move on uh, to motions, a request motion from commissioners. Commissioner Oliverio. What's the dog's name? Her name is Willa and she is a foster rescue from the Silicon Valley Pet Project. And um, she's a baby, so she's, she was starting to cry. <laughs> so she said hello. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. I believe it really meets the goals of the downtown. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's where the downtown is growing, right? And we want uh, different articulated buildings. And, um, you know, the last item we approved, we approved six acres for 100% low income housing. That'll pay no property tax. And something like this actually provides revenue to the city that will then be able to provide the revenue to pay for city services and city employees. So it's important to have balance. And I really think, uh, you know, 
uh, building uh, the office in the downtown, the core of the city where we have transit makes great sense. And so I, I would like to support the motion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, second it from Commissioner Casey. Um, do we have discussion? Any additional comments? Well, I would just like to echo uh, Commissioner Oliverio's comments. I think this really helps us get towards our better balanced um, uh, um, employment ratios, uh, which we've sort of been, um, they've been in decline and, and we haven't really ever been able to get to them. And so some, a project like this of this scale uh, helps us get there. So I think this is great. And um, I do think that the applicant is doing uh, what it can to address the environmental issues that have been raised. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Vice Chair Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Casey. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Lardinois. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Torrens. And I saw you say aye, but we couldn't quite hear you. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, Chair Caballero is also an aye. And so uh, we'll pause for this item, which is 8B, to be posted on the screen. Great, that passes unanimously. Um, you know, I think that this year we've really been seeing um, what the future of downtown is going to look like, and it's really exciting. So very happy to be part of the Planning Commission that's moving some of these awesome projects forward. Okay, so number nine is to close the general plan public hearing. And number 10 is referrals from city council boards and uh, commissions and other agencies. Um, which there were no items. Number 11 is good and welfare. And Michael, do we have a staff report from city council? Yeah, I have a lot of items. Just one second. So one thing I should mention is that the flea market rezoning in the Barrier to Bart Urban Village plan was um, going to go on the 8th, but it was deferred to the 20, June 22nd. So it is going on June 22nd. Um, and let me pull up the other items, uh, give me a second here. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, May 25th, I think you, you read the papers, but uh, Downtown West and was uh, approved by council um, and uh, DSAP was also approved with direction that some additional work be done with the, the DANG, which is the neighborhood group to address some concerns or some work out some issues related to the interface with the existing single family neighborhood. Um, let's see what else. Uh, okay, the other big news was that the mixed use and uh, urban village zoning districts uh, were approved by council on May 18th. There, I don't think you heard this one because it's an annexation, but there was an annexation to San Jose of a property of 50 one five four one five Woodward Road that got approved. Uh, I don't think you would have heard this either. It was a tentative map and a conforming rezoning at three one five five Silver Creek Road that was approved. Um, hang on one second. And I think that's it. Let me just double check here. Yes, that, that is it for tonight. Okay, Commissioner Torrance, did you have a question or comment? I have a comment on when we get to number 11. We are on number 11, we're on 11A. Okay, I, I this is um, just an observation that I made this evening. So Michael, I noticed white shirt, white tie. Oh, I don't have a I don't have a white tie. It's a white shirt only. Oh, okay. Let's see your tie. Oh, I don't have a tie. Not wearing your tie. Okay. No. Okay. Not, I don't have my glasses on. Well, I just noticed that the, the planner uh, before the PCBE in that prior thing, he was wearing a white shirt and white tie. Oh, that I, was Alex. Yeah, I thought you two had planned your wardrobe, so I just no, no. We have the same shirt. I don't know if you had a white tie on, but we are wearing the same type of shirt, buttoned all the way to the top. You're right. I I actually saw him buttoned all the way to the top, and I copied him. Uniform. It's the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll that for, but I just had to throw it out there just for fun. 
Well, Thank on that you. note, I also noticed that Michael has gotten a haircut. And so I think that city staff are starting to make their plans to come back into the office. <laughs> yeah, I was like, my, well, I, I just, yeah, my first haircut in a year, right? So I, I grew my hair almost into a ponytail back to my early days in planning. And it's now. Short. I'm envious, Michael. I'm envious. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you for that report. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to item 11B, which is the election of chair and vice chairs for fiscal year 2021 and through 2022. And uh, do we have any um, comments or uh, motions related to that? Uh, Commissioner, have your hand still up, or maybe it's up again. Again, because uh, I, I, would say let's continue with who we have. I think you're both doing a great job. So that's that's my feeling. Um, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, I uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I actually will decline that nomination um, and instead uh, um, make a nomination for Vice Chair Bonilla to take over as chair. Um, I've uh, very much enjoyed doing, uh, being chair and leading us through this sort of unprecedented time, both with the types of projects that we've been reviewing, but also with doing this fully virtually for over the last year. Um, but I'm ready to, to, to hand it off and, and give some responsibility back to somebody else. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to the time when we can actually get to know each other in person and, and have these meetings again. But um, I will dec decline that nomination, uh, Commissioner Torrens, but very much appreciated and um, make a motion for uh, to nominate uh, uh, Commissioner Bonilla as chair of the Planning Commission for the next fiscal year. Second that. Uh, that has been seconded by Lardinal. Do we have any other discussion? And I guess at this time I'd ask uh, if uh, Vice Chair Bonilla would um, accept the nomination. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for the nomination. I. I respectfully accept and, and Deborah, I, I was actually in, in the same camp as you were. Uh, I got to know Mariela on the campaign trail and she knows personally because we talked how much I respect her, uh, how much I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to share leadership with her and, and candidly even bigger than what we do, how, how happy I am to have built the relationship. My only regret is that we got into COVID and I, I didn't get to give her any more rides after meetings, but now that we're coming back, we'll, we'll get to do that again. So uh, I, I graciously accept, uh, but I, I do say uh, it has been a, a privilege to be your partner in this process. You, you have been the chair of the planning commission of the largest city in the Bay Area during a very, very exciting time. And you know, I've said this to you privately, so I'll say it publicly. You have dealt with it with grace, with class, uh, and you have made me very proud to be a member of this body. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have a motion and a second um, to nominate uh, Chair Bonilla, um, or Vice Chair Bonilla as Chair of the Planning Commission. Um, Vera, do we uh, vote on that and then do uh, Vice Chair uh, separately or should we just do them together? Um, why don't we do them separately? Okay, great. So do we have any further hands or just on, um, on uh, this nomination? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Bonilla. I'm thinking about, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner Casey. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Lardinois. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Torrens. And uh, Chair Caballero is also an aye. Congratulations uh, to our new chair. And I guess a uh, point of clarification, does that start in July or does it start for the next meeting? <laughs> J July is fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> it does say fiscal year. So. Right, July is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, Commissioner Torrens, you have your hand raised. Thank you. I would like to nominate uh, Commissioner Casey as vice chair. Commissioner Casey, do you accept the I, I do. Thank you, Commissioner Torrance. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Oliverio has seconded. 
Um, and then I'll recognize uh, Vice Chair Bonilla. To vote on it now? Uh, no, I'm recognizing you. Oh, no, my hand's been up. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Do we have any um, uh, any additional discussion? Sorry, I lost one of my screens. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any additional comments or hands raised, so I guess we'll go ahead and vote. Um, uh, Vice Chair Bonilla. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Casey. Aye. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Lardinois? Aye. Commissioner Lardinois, if you said something, we did not hear you. Oh, my bad. Aye. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio? Aye. And uh, Chair uh, Caballero is an aye. Okay. So we'll and Torrens is an aye. aye also. I'm so sorry, Commissioner Torrens. You know, you would think that after a year of have that order memorized, but I really haven't. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> so, all right, that's unanimous. Um, so FY21 at 22 commission is uh, chair is uh, Commissioner Bonilla and vice chair is Commissioner Casey. So, um, and, uh, oh, excuse me, Chair Caballero, it is correct that the term starts July 1st. Oh, thank you. No, I just checked the bylaws. It's in Article 1, Section 3A. I thought so. I just thought it would be good to yeah. do that publicly. Yeah, I, no, I just double check. Thank you. Orlando already updated his LinkedIn. Oh, it's already <laughs> updated. <Yeah. laughs> oh, okay, so item C11C is Subcommittee Information Reports and Outstanding Business. I don't think I don't see any items related to that. Uh -huh. Item D is Commissioner Calendar and Study Session. Staff, do we have any changes to the calendar or the study sessions? None that I'm aware of. Okay, Michael, can you check in with Robert? I had asked for a study session related to displacement, um, particularly related to small businesses. Um, Sure, we've been, yeah, we're talking about that with OE. Let, all, let me circle back with OE, the Office of Economic Development on that. I know it couldn't happen before the end of this fiscal year, but we were talking about scheduling that next fiscal year. So let me, uh, we'll circle back with them. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate um, an update on that at the next meeting on the 22nd. Not necessarily, but just maybe a general time frame that we think we might, if it's going to be in the first or second quarter of the next fiscal year. Um, I just think that given all the variety of um, projects that have come forward um, and the interest from this commission related to economic development and displacement issues, that um, that conversation in today's session will be useful. Um, okay, so uh, any items for the public record? Oh, uh, Vera, you have your hand up. Is that still related to the? Um... It is not. Uh, it's no. Um, ignore that, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, all right. It's a leftover. So Yep, yep. Uh, sometimes we're not quick enough on the draw and the taking down of our hands. Um, okay, so um, no items for the public record. And um, I will go ahead and adjourn until our next meeting, which is June 23rd, I believe, at 630. Hopefully that's right. Um, and wish everybody a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.